2018 has been a big year for the UK's smallest mobile network operator, 3, with lots of new developments and announcements, and them being judged the best network for data performance in towns by testing organisation P3. So let's start off with the announcements, the first of which is Huawei being the 5G radio access network vendor for 3, which is absolutely major news considering the lead that Huawei is said to have in the 5G game compared to some of their competitors. And we're talking in the region of about 6 to 12 months that have been described. This is especially important when you consider the huge amount of 5G spectrum that 3 now have, which I'll talk about in a moment. A new high capacity dark fiber network deal with SSE Enterprise Telecoms was also released and this will provide high speed dark fiber connectivity to 3's existing and new data centers of which they are installing quite a number of new data centers to provide extra capacity and it will also help with resilience. And that is not the only deal with SSE Enterprise Telecoms either. Together with O2, a deal was announced to install fibre into the London sewer network to provide backhaul capacity to their sites. Again, because of the increased backhaul required for 5G. In other vendor related news, 3 have been deploying Nokia's fully integrated cloud native core network into their new and existing data centres in a project that started in 2017. This new core network is said to be a key enabler for their 5G and announcements of this development also included lots of virtualization type terminology like more resilient, scalable and future proofed. But nonetheless, Nokia has a strong reputation for core network products and assuming that the migration from their existing core goes completely successfully, the migration to a new core network system is unlikely to be a bad thing, especially with a lot of the advantages, especially in terms of things like scalability and resilience that can come from virtualization across multiple data centers and cloud-based systems. 3 also acquired some additional spectrum in the 3.4, 3.5 gigahertz band from the UK's spectrum auction in 2018. And this complements their existing huge chunk of spectrum in that frequency range through the acquisition of UK broadband. But as of very recently, Ofcom granted three the spectrum license change required for three to be able to launch 5G with a carrier of 100 megahertz bandwidth, which is the full 5G carrier bandwidth capability and they'll be the only network to be able to do that. Having now covered the announcements of 3 in the year 2018, let's talk about some things that are more visible to the person on the ground. Perhaps the most major of which has been the increased footprint of 2100 MHz refarm sites and the carrier aggregation footprint increase that has come from that. Back in 2017, 3 started re-farming 3G spectrum on 2100 MHz to 4G in the form of the UARFCN carriers 10588 and 10612 being converted into L21 EARFCN 99. This massively increased the amount of bandwidth available on site with a subsequent substantial performance uplift, especially in busy, dense urban areas. While carry aggregation, also known as 4G+, 
has been previously available in certain areas through band 20 LO8 and band 3 LO18. It was quite limited in availability and usually restricted to having the LO8 as a primary carrier. So it was really quite rare to see it. And the other carrier aggregation that was seen was between band 32 and another carrier and that's only available in Oxford. So the addition of L21 to lots of sites and therefore the resultant aggregation between the L18 already on the site and L21 has increased the availability of 4G plus carrier aggregation significantly. Theoretical throughput wise, the L18 alone has a downlink maximum of about 113 megabits per second and the L21 adds 75 megabits per second downlink to that bringing the total to 187.5 megabits per second total with the two aggregated. Important to note though is that the addition of the L21 will offload the L18 cells reducing their loading which will increase the overall network system efficiency in the area as well. So more spectrum and higher spectral efficiency is why the uplift ends up being so high. I was getting speeds of over 100 megabits per second quite typically on one of these L18 plus L21 sites in the centre of Hull. In addition, in the L21 reform areas, 3 has introduced load balancing between especially the L21 L18 but also in some cases 3G through different priorities on RRC release. As part of this upgrade we also saw some new hardware in the form of Kalus U21 plus L21 diplexers which combine the single U21 3G carrier with the L21 into a single feeder essentially. Next up are the six sector site upgrades. So moving from a typical three sector configuration to six sectors increases the site's capacity by a factor of about 1.3 to 1.6 times dependent on the exact environment around the site that's being converted to six sector because obviously these six beams have to fit within the existing site sector layout for the area. So if you're going from three sectors to six sectors without reorganising the sites neighbouring it, you will get some overlap that you wouldn't have had before, which therefore counteracts the increase to six sectors a little bit. This example in Barking has six sectors for both L18 and L21, but most of the six sector upgrades we've seen so far have only been for L18, but time will tell whether later on they'll also get six sector L21 as well. The Barking example uses old legacy and phenol antennas with each a 33 degree beam on them so six of those means six 33 degree beams as opposed to three 65 degree beams um, and they are likely using those antennas on this site because it was previously it would previously have been a six sector 3g site so most likely they've done the 2100 megahertz diplexer trick so diplexed in the L21 with the U21 and then diplexed the UL21 with L18 into those 33 degree high ports. The other antennas on the master for EE services and also probably for three's three sector L08 as well. Since we've now spoken a little bit about spectrum developments that have happened in terms of deploying more of it as 4G and six sector site upgrades, I will now talk about what features they've kind of deployed on the spectrum that are a little bit new. And the first of these is 64QAM uplink. 
So prior to this upgrade, 3 only had 16 quam in the uplink direction, which has fewer bits per hertz compared to 64 quam uplink. And therefore, with the upgrade to 64 quam upload, upload speeds about a third higher can be achieved, which means up to 56 megabits per second on the L18 and 37.5 megabits per second on the L21 because it's got 10 megahertz of uplink bandwidth compared to L18's 15. But of course this is very useful for uploading big files like videos and will definitely make a noticeable difference if you are trying to upload stuff in good signal conditions where 64 quam upload will be used if your device supports it. Mobility robustness optimization. Now, this is really cool. Offsets are applied to the RSRP measurement of certain cells based on PCI. This therefore makes some cells more or less attractive to hand over to than they would otherwise be, which therefore will make handover to certain cells happen earlier, later or not at all. This then improves the handover success rate, reduces the risk of data drops and data failure, and stops system capacity being wasted by devices being on inappropriate cells. Unfortunately, it is only available in certain urban areas at the moment, so it could do with expanding in footprint. In addition, it is only available in dedicated mode and not idle mode, and it would also be nice for 3 to start incorporating measurements like RSRQ into their A3 offset rather than just RSRP. Early in 2018, 3's mobility strategy, in other words how devices move between different layers of the network, changed network wide, following on from changes that were initially introduced on sites where the 2100 MHz spectrum had been reformed from 3G to 4G. 3's mobility strategy changes will ensure that users remain on L18 for much longer, a consequence of the stricter conditions required to reselect or hand over to 3G, and additionally, greater ease at which devices can move from L08 to L18. While these changes have generally improved time on 4G, some have criticised them for placing excessive cell edge load onto the L18, risking possible hemorrhage of capacity to that layer, and therefore they would like to see further development of 3's mobility strategy, such as through the use of quality-based reselection and handover, handover from L08 to L18 being more common, and for there to be stricter conditions required to hand over or reselect from L18 to L08, such that users actually end up being placed on a better layer and therefore have an improved experience. Also, less blind carry aggregation would definitely be appreciated. On some rural L08 sites, 3 has massively increased the reference signal power, thereby improving the site's dominance, resulting in improved handover success rate and downlink performance. However, the increased reference signal power does not actually increase the accessible cell footprint, because 3 apply compensatory changes to ensure that devices do not stray outside of the uplink range. 3 also joined the Blue Water Shopping Centre inbuilding solution, which will no doubt be very appreciated by any of their customers that use the shopping centre, because previously, like with the other networks, the arena has been served by a macro outside which overlooks the buildings. The trouble is that the buildings obviously attenuate the signal a lot and regardless there's just a huge number of people that visit B 
because of the huge array of retail outlets that exist there. And therefore, even if it was like an outside retail park, not that such a thing could exist in the UK with the weather, um, it would still hemorrhage the site. But then with them all being on sell edge as well, it's not particularly surprising that up until the inbuilding solution was fitted, that all the networks utterly struggled inside. So three are SISO on it, which is not particularly surprising, but the speeds are still good. So over 50 megabits per second, which is obviously an absolutely colossal improvement on what you would have received previously. Not so much to do with 3's network itself, but still important to their customers is roaming abroad. And in 2018, 3 introduced 4G roaming. And as of today, or when this list was produced quite recently, they have actually a surprisingly large number of providers in a lot of different countries with which they support 4G roaming now. And last but not least, 5G. At the Mobile Broadband World Conference, they had uh, their joint Huawei 3 demo bus, and there was also a temporary mast there with a number of Huawei massive MIMO panels as well as Huawei conventional remote radios connected to Huawei antennas. There was a new EARFCN noted as well, 124, which replaces the first 3G carrier of UARFCN 10564, which is usually the one that remains when they do L21. So a little bit bizarre, perhaps something of a sign of the future. In terms of what they will do in 2019, there is relatively little evidence in the form of planning applications as to what their plans are. Some of the max configuration acquisition trials do list 3 5G in the antenna details, but that still doesn't tell us much about their actual deployment strategy. However, if they are using conventional panels, that would lead you down the line of thinking ATAR rather than massive MIMO. But again, this isn't clear at all. Like they, they could actually just be massive MIMO panels, but illustrated on a diagram as looking more like antennas. Thanks for watching this video about 3's network development in 2018. Quite a lot of them in quite a lot of different ways and hopefully 2019 will be filled with just as many improvements and of course the 5G as well.